So being a leader, it isn't being sat in your corner office, owning the business, getting your systems, and getting your KPI sheets through. And I kind of fell into that hole over the years. And this isn't coming from a place of superiority, like I'm the best leader going, but I'm constantly developing these techniques and trying to be the best leader that I can. And I had to divide out management from leadership. So a few years back, um, I used to surround myself with people that were growing businesses. I still do it now, um, but they were different type of people and they would talk about work smart, not hard. You don't need to put 10,000 hours to be an expert, things like that. And, and by the way, I agree with that, but actually I believe in work smart and hard. Why not do both? But when I was in that mindset of work smart, not hard and outsource and get yourself out of the business to work on the business, not in the business, and it is true, in order to grow exponentially, you do need to think strategically. You need to have that oxygen to work as hard as possible. But actually, I still work in my business and I love it. Um, probably a bit too much sometimes, but being a great leader is about inspiring, is about growing, is about listening, is about understanding and pushing your team to be the best version of themselves so that they can turn up in the best way for you, your clients and financially grow everything around you. So as I said, I'm not coming from a place of perfection here. I'm coming more of a place of a Kaizen approach, a constant and never ending improvement. Okay, so I'm just working my way up here and I'm, I'm sharing with you what I've learned sometimes in the hard way and what I've just naturally grown into. So number one is is about being straightforward and transparent. When I started hiring people, especially like the third, fourth hire, I tried to sell the dream of what this was gonna be. And I am a bit of a dreamer. I am a bit of a, oh, I hate this word, visionary. I like to think five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, and it's, it's very logical in my brain. And when people were excited and passionate, I'd go, oh, I wanna be around those sort of people because that's like me, right? But actually, you don't need to hire people like you. You need to hire people, if anything, that are the opposite of you, that think differently to you, that challenge you, that have skill sets that you don't have. And I used to sell this dream based on what I thought they wanted to hear. And those team members never fit in, ever. Um, and they've left, right? And the reason for that, I think, is I hired the wrong person or they joined the wrong company because I was trying to change what the company was about. So now I, re I try to be as objective, as transparent and straightforward as I can about the vision of the company, what we're looking to achieve and what their role is within, within it. Now, this causes one of two things. It, it segments people. You don't tend to have those. I mean, you're always going to have those team members that just sit in the middle. It's a, it's a pay for them. And that's that, right? Um, most people in my team, that is really not for them. This is a career. This is a movement. This is a passion. And, you know, I, I would argue this is a lifestyle choice for them. Um, in a big way and seeing where this company is growing. And what that does is either they look at it and go, wow, I really want to be a part of that. And they, they're passionate. They go all in. I was having a meeting yesterday with one of my team that was saying, look, I want to, I'm starting to earn money. It's starting to come through. I want you to hold on to it and buy some properties together. And that for me is just like, yeah, I love that. You know, they want to grow within the company. It's really exciting. Or somebody's going to go, this sounds a bit woo woo. I'm not really into that. I just want a safe and secure job. And this company's not for me. Both are great. And actually one of the key lessons I learned early on about being a great leader is learn who the right people to lead are and learn who you need to let go. And it's that whole fire, um, hire fast, fire faster. And I'm not saying I wanna fire people quickly, but a great leader is able to focus on the people that are truly passionate about growth in the business and let go of the fact that most people won't be right for you. So next is about connecting with your team on a personal level. Now, I've got really mixed emotions around it. Actually, no, I don't. I'm very fixed on my opinion on it, but people have mixed emotions. So don't mix business with pleasure. Don't hire friends. Don't hire family. And by the way, I have hired friends and it's gone horribly wrong. Um, and I've hired friends and it's gone really, really well. I've been in business with my best friend for over, almost well, over a decade now. And I absolutely love 20% of it. No, I'm joking. I love it. And... Um, I think a big reason of it is, you know, another thing is say like, they are your staff, not your friends. And I disagree that you can't be both. Like I've got a great relationship with some of my team and, and, and I find it really important to get to know them as people, not just the person you pay to do their job. Um, 
And there's pros and cons with this. Sometimes they're going to take the piss a little. They are because they feel that they can get away with a little bit more. But actually, they're also more bought into you. They're also more passionate because actually when you're doing something, they want you to do well, not because you pay them, but because they actually, well, I feel that vibe anyway. They want me to grow as a person because they know that they're going to grow with me. Um, the other thing is it really gets me to understand what motivates them. So I'm, I'm very money oriented. I'm not ashamed to say that. Like I love money. I love making a load of money and a lot of my team are. There's also a lot of my team that money, as long as they're looked after, is not a very big concern for them. They have higher values. And so it's easy to, for me to make the assumption of I'll just chuck money at a problem, right? But actually, it's about getting to know people and understand what they're going on on that deeper level that number one gets you to understand what, to what motivates them, but also gets you more bought into them and them more bought into you. So the next is creating a great environment. So I don't mean the trees outside and things like that, but I do mean environment in the office as well. So something I'm really trying to push forward is having a tidy office, keeping it clean, keeping it organized. And it's really hard because we're quite a disruptive and fast moving company. So it's hard to have fast moving disruption, get on the phones, talk to people, add value, and by the way, clean your desk as well. It's hard to balance those up. But I mean the environment in the office as well, the people that we're working with. So I'm getting bigger and bigger on culture right now and understanding the personalities that I want and the personalities that I don't want. Which leads me on to a really big environment and that is what is your place in that environment? So there's a big, there's so many ways of leading, okay? So there's push leadership that is kind of, imagine um, somebody running and you are running behind them with a whip. You know, come on, move, 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 move. Or the style that I prefer is leading from the front. So again, I do not come from a place of perfection. I screw up more than most people, but I try to learn from my mistakes quickly and I throw myself at something. So selling, for example, I won't just tell them how to do it just before filming this. It's jumping on a phone call, recording it and going, listen to what I'm saying, listen to the tonality to help close something on a property deal. So leading from the front does so many things. First of all, kinesthetic learning is one of the most powerful ways of learning. So learning from actually doing, learning from actually seeing. Number two, it's quite inspirational for people to see that you will work harder than most. So nowadays I've got staff that like getting in early, early. Um, but for a long time, I would be the first person in, and still a lot of the time I will be, the first person in the office and the last person to leave. And that's not just because, that's just who I am. You know, I will work hard. And even on a subconscious level, I know that people register that. So I don't think there could ever be a situation where my team think they work harder than me. Um, and nor should they, by the way. You know, I, I run the business, I own the business, and I'm gonna benefit most from the business growth. But I want them to know that I am passionate about what I'm talking about. I'm passionate about the growth of this business. And whether it's a sales call, doing an ad, working, um, doing content like this, or even helping with some admin issues, I'm gonna be there to support and lead from the front so that they know and feel confident in their position. They always have somebody there supporting them. So the next is about feedback. So I think feedback is the breakfast of champions. I think it's a one-way street and a gift. And what I mean by this is you can take it how you want. If you wanna take it on and improve on it, that's great. But what I like is feedback cycles. The quicker you get a feedback cycle, the better. So in a sales call, for example, when you get an objection, um, and you can't overcome it. That's a feedback cycle. And then you go, how can I improve that next time? So then the next time you get that objection, you're able to overcome it, right? If it's right for the person. And it's the same for feedback. I believe in the Kaizen approach to most things, continuous and ever uh, improving development in that. I'm sure that's not the direct translation, but this constant improvement and these feedback cycles. So I, I'm not a big fan of yearly reviews. I know it's more formal and stuff like that. I prefer giving feedback in the moment. Look, I can see you're doing that. I don't like the way that's happening. This is what I would have preferred. Um, and that's with everything. If it's a call, look, I heard that you could have said this a bit better. Here's how I would improve it. Um, if it's a video um, and Alex will be like, oh, that thumbnail you did was really good. I would want more like that or that one I wasn't a big fan of or things like that. And the more you can give feedback, the more people can improve on slower, smaller amounts. The problem with these big reviews is you go, 
Here's things you can improve. Scroll opens. Because there's thousands of things we can improve on, you know. We're, we're so crap overall. Like, there's so many things we do wrong, myself included, more than most, right? Whereas if you can give somebody digestible, bite-sized content to take away with them, hey, look, I've noticed you've been doing this recently. I think a better way of approaching this would be this. What do you think? Yeah, that's good. Great. Should we try that for the next week and then maybe chat about it at the end of the week? See how we got on. That is digestible and able to put it on. Which leads me on to the next bit. 360 feedback. Now, nobody likes feedback, but if I'm gonna dish it out, I need to be able to take it myself. And it's one of the benefits and drawbacks of teams being friends and stuff like that is um, sometimes the feedback can be just as brutal towards you. But you need to take that on the chin because ultimately, if I'm gonna be giving feedback that affects the environment, I need to follow that feedback and call myself on it. I need to, when I'm giving that feedback, accept the fact that, by the way, I'm not perfect at this. I'm just setting the tone of where we wanna be delivering, all of us. So make sure as a leader, people feel comfortable to give the feedback to you as well as a leader because I am not the best leader in the world. I'm, I'm certainly not the best manager, I'm an awful manager. Um, but I'm, I'm good at what I'm good at and I want to improve the rest. So make sure the feedback is 360 so you can give it and take it and we're all improving at the same level. This isn't about I'm the high almighty and all of you can dream about reaching my level one day, okay? It's you're all here. You're all on the same level. We're all a team moving towards the same goal. Don't see leadership as a job, okay? I genuinely believe this. So entrepreneurship has become like, entrepreneurship used to mean you were a bum. You could get a job, it never did, but that's how people perceived it. Entrepreneurship's a really big, popular word right now that's going around, so everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. The thing is, not many people are number one, okay? And I really think it's important for me to expand around this. I don't mean number one like you're the best thing in the world, but being number one, the spearhead of a company, comes with a lot of pros. You get most of the thanks, um, you get to do most of the inspiring, which I love. When you're making money, everyone thanks you for it because you're at the head. When you're marketing, you're usually the face um, of that and you get all of the thanks for that as well. The downsides of being the spearhead is when it goes wrong, it's your fault. By being the face of the company, you're the one who gets smeared. Okay, When you do ads, you're the one getting slagged off. Um, you also take the most risk. Okay, so everyone focuses on the businesses that make money, um, but what about when you lose money? Because if the team does really well one, uh, some, uh, one month, I'll make more money in the business, right? If they do really poorly, or we do poorly as a team one month, I don't go, you're getting paid less. I have to pay that out of my pocket, okay? So it comes with pros and cons, and I think it's really important to accept. So my business partner says, um, and this is Dan, and I just think what humility that he's got here is he goes, you're number one, I'm number two, and I'm perfectly comfortable in that position. And he is so supportive, and, and he's my business partner, we are equal partners, but we understand our roles. By being the front runner and the leader, there's certain obligations and stresses you have to take on that nobody else will get. And I think it's really important if you're watching this video and you are a leader is, are you a leader? or are you a number two? And you need to really take that on board. If you're looking for uh, an operations manager at some point, is make sure they are a leader, that they are gonna take charge and they are gonna move forward because this isn't a job that you can do lightly. It's a, you have to be passionate about leading. You have to be passionate about people. You need to really give a shit. You need to really care about people's futures and outcomes honestly, more than your own. Because once you start making money, you realize that's not what motivates you. A true leader is motivated by other people around them being inspired. And you need to have that just as an innate part of who you are.